2023 City of Tualatin work session. We have a couple items on the agenda tonight to cover. Our first is Tualatin Strategic and Equitable Housing Funding Plan, uh, led by Steve and Aaron. Welcome, both of you. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Good evening. We're pleased to be here tonight to present a project update on Tualatin's Equitable Housing Funding Plan. Um, as you mentioned, I'm joined here by Aaron Engman, and then joining us via Zoom is our project team from Eco Northwest, who is lending their technical expertise to the project. Their team includes Beth Goodman, Senior Policy Advisor and Project Director, Kryn Saucedo, Senior Project Manager, and Mary Chase, Urban Systems Associate. And Beth will kick us off um, with a project overview of the project purpose. Beth? Thank you very much. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. So what we're doing here is we're building on Tualatin's recent housing work. Um, the city completed a housing needs analysis and adopted it in 2019. What that did is that provided a factual basis for understanding the city's housing needs as well as the city's buildable lands inventory um, and other uh, characteristics of the city. Then in 2021, the city adopted a housing production strategy, which is essentially what are we going to do about the city's unmet housing needs? Um, and one of the strategies in there um, was to conduct, to develop an equitable funding uh, plan, equitable housing funding plan, sorry. Um, if we go to the next slide. So, on the next slide, this plan shows uh, this uh, shows that the project's purpose is to provide next steps Hold towards. Up, uh, I'm sorry. We're trying to get, we haven't got to the next slide yet. There we go. <laughs> okay, I was I was just gonna you know describe what was said on there. Um, <laughs> so, what is the city supposed to do as it's looking at supporting affordable housing um, and looking towards fair and equitable housing outcomes? So in this, we chose the actions in the housing production strategy that are most related to either getting money um, to support housing or using money to support housing. So it's a subset. Um, it's a small subset of the actions in the housing production plan. As we're looking at this, we're thinking broadly about equity, um, equity and implementation of the housing production plan, um, the HPS. Um, as well as equity um, in the trade-offs and the financial trade-offs of the actions considered here. So on the next slide, essentially what we're talking about is a, a, a few of the tools in your tools box um, to support housing development that's especially affordable housing development for moderate income households. We're focusing on equity considerations, we're focusing on fiscal considerations. Um, we started this project on the next slide, um, a little more than a year ago. Um, here we are towards the end um, where we are working with our committee one last time. We've met with them five times so far to help develop this plan. Um, and we're finalizing the, uh, the draft um, based on discussions here with the city council, as well as we'll be talking to the planning commission soon to give them an update on where we are and our um, advisory committee. And I noticed that one of our advisory committee members, um, Susan, is here in the audience. Um, so uh, I wanted to acknowledge her. A lot of the work in the project has been about understanding um, what it is we're doing in these different strategies, and we'll talk about those. So just a reminder, your existing conditions, um, when we look at cost burden in Tualatin, about 38% of households are cost burdened, meaning that they spend 30% or more of their income on housing costs. When we look at renters, 52% of your renters are cost burdened. 26% are severely cost burdened, meaning that they spend 50% or more of their income on housing costs. Um, when we see cost burden rates like this in um, Tualatin, they're similar to what we're seeing across the metro region for many communities. So next slide, please. To provide a little bit more context, as we're thinking about affordability, we think about it based on household size. So what we're showing here is um, uh, incomes for households that are four people households um, and the housing costs that they can afford. So this project focuses, generally speaking, on households with incomes below 80% of median family income. 
And in 2021, that was uh, $77,500. You can see that a household with that income could afford about $1,940 in, uh, in rent or in, in housing payments. So based on information from the um, 2020 housing needs analysis, what we saw is that your median sales price was uh, $492,000. That's well above the median household income. So this household at 80% of median family income, they can't afford that housing. When we look at monthly rents, again, this was 2020 data, um, and we account for utilities, it was nearly $1,600 a month in utilities. So this household, this theoretical household, could afford um, many rents in Tualatin. Um, but households with lower incomes, like 50% of median family income, can't afford those market rate rents. So this project is really all about these issues. On the next slide. What we're showing you here in, in our red box is the uh, households that are really focused on in this, uh, in this project. So this shows your existing households um, in dark blue and the forecast of new households in a teal sort of color. Um, and you can see um, taken all together, there's a little fewer than uh, 6,000 households. Um, uh, I can't do that math on the fly, um, but in, in this group, below 80% of median family income. Before I go on, are there any questions about that, that uh, foundational data? <clears throat> okay. So... <laughs> So in that um, screen where you have the house and you're saying if your household earns and you can afford this, that's just the rent there, not including utilities. Is that correct? The 1940, um, there is monthly rent, including utilities. It's um, okay. essentially $77,000 divided by 12 months times 0.3%. That's 1940. Okay, so it would include utilities. Mm -hmm. And the housing sales prices shown there aren't really accounting for um, the increases in interest rates that we've seen. So people would be yeah. able to borrow less than what you see there. Plus, um, I, you know, those, I know the rents have gone up quite a bit since these. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of frightening. Yeah. Yeah, it has. It hasn't gotten any better. We'll say that in the last two and a half years. Okay, so then a little bit of information about how to think about um, what the city's role is in uh, supporting affordable housing development, and then uh, some of the things, uh, the kind of gap that how, uh, housing developers face. So Tualatin um, has direct influence on several of these factors that affect um, housing uh, development. So you have to have public policy that supports um, uh, development of a feasible project. And right now we're talking about a market rate project. So not an income restricted housing project, just a little different. So you have to have the right zoning and density and design requirements, et cetera. Tualatin directly controls that. Land, um, Tualatin partially controls, but also partially doesn't. So you've got people who own um, uh, parcels of land that's outside of Tualatin's control. Um, but looking at um, how much land there is in the city um, and working with Metro um, when it's needed on a, an expansion um, is something that cities in west side of Metro do. And then looking at infrastructure development is also something that cities do. Considering market feasibility, um, what that really means is that there has to be enough demand that rents and sales prices are high enough to support development of a profitable project. And of course, what a profitable project is, say for a single family unit, is different than a profitable project for say a duplex or a townhouse. Um, the city has a little bit of um, influence in market feasibility that we'll talk about. The city has a lesser role to play in capital. So your developers have to be able to access resources for investments. So these things are certainly true for um, market rate development and they're, they're partially true. 
um, but in, in different ways for um, development of income restricted affordable housing. And the city can play different roles in that. And so that's housing that your, your, um, your nonprofits might develop that's affordable below 60% of uh, median family income. Your housing authority um, has a role of developing that. Um, it's a little bit different. Um, so if we go on to the next slide. So in either a market rate um, or a, uh, uh, an affordable housing development, you have different funding sources. Um, an income restricted affordable housing development will often have 15 or 20 funding sources, whereas market rate uh, development has many fewer funding sources. And to get the type of project that you might want, like maybe the city wants to see um, uh, housing that's uh, multifamily that is, you know, say a three-story building um, or a five-story building um, that's affordable at 80% of median family income, there can be a funding gap. Um, so just not enough money. So you can't charge the rents that would be necessary to support the development costs um, of a profitable project. Or if it's income restricted, there's just not enough money simply to do the construction. Um, and so that's part of where cities increasingly um, are stepping in um, and working with partners um, to also step in to look at funding gaps. And uh, the state, of course, plays roles in this, as, as does the federal government. Foundations can play roles, et cetera. Another way of doing it is reducing um, the costs um, either to develop or the cost to uh, uh, operate the housing after it's developed. And we'll talk about a few of those kind of um, uh, actions that would support that. So on to the next slide. So at the top in green here, we've got the um, actions in the housing production strategy that um, add uh, funding. So a local construction excise tax, and we'll talk about what that is in a few minutes, um, can uh, add funding. So it's a funding source um, to serve uh, development mostly of uh, housing, certainly that's below 80% of MFI, median family uh, income or um, area median income, they're the same thing. Um, and sometimes uh, below 60% of area median income. Urban renewal, um, I know that's been something that the city's been looking at in developing the core area urban renewal district. That's another potential source of funding. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about lots of other potential sources of funding. Um, but, uh, or maybe we won't, but um, our report talks about lots of other potential sources of funding. But let me just say that they're, they're few and far between uh, other funding sources, like say the general fund, um, they tend to already be um, used for other, res uh, for other priorities um, within the city. Um, things like the, the Metro bonds, those are an excellent source of funding. Um, we're considering those as a possible funding source, but on top of that, what might the city uh, have available beyond the Metro bond? And then you've got actions, um, if you'll go back, I'm sorry. Then you've got actions that uh, lower the cost of development or the cost of operations that forego revenue. So you recently adopted the, non uh, the nonprofit low income tax exemption that foregoes revenue. So a building that was built using that tax exemption, the city wouldn't get property tax exemption from uh, property taxes from that for the duration of that exemption. The same thing is true for the multi-unit property tax exemption. And then the city can also choose if it has a funding source to support it um, to uh, exempt system development charges from some uh, from some buildings um, where you're getting affordable housing development. And by exempt, what we really mean is pay for the system development charges in a different way. Um, and we'll talk about that in uh, a few minutes. And then the last set are um, things that directly need money. So homeowner assistance programs um, and uh, uh, things like rehabilitation, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, establishing a uh, housing trust fund. Um, that's uh, also something that would uh, need to identify funding sources. Next slide, please. 
So there's a lot of actions that are not considered in the uh, in this plan that are in the HPS. So things like changes to develop uh, the development code, looking at opportunities um, to add density or support redevelopment. Some of these things, um, especially supporting redevelopment, are partially considered in here, but not really directly. So urban renewal, for instance, supports redevelopment. Um, there's lots of other ways to uh, support um, housing development, which I won't, uh, affordable housing development, um, and to preserve affordable housing development. There's things um, to uh, that are impediments to fair housing and education about fair housing that are actions in the HPS. And then there's um, uh, actions that are evaluating um, capital improvement planning programming um, to support affordable uh, and workforce housing development. So those things, they're all in the HPS. The city is expecting to consider them, but they're not considered directly in this. Before I go on to talk about the actions, are there any questions? Question? Anyone with their hand up? Proceed. All right. So then, on the potential actions, what we have given you here is a very high level summary of, uh, of what this is. Um, so in this case, the construction excise tax. Um, the expectation is that the information presented in the funding plan will help the city decide um, whether it wants to implement um, these different actions. Um, it provides more information about what it means to implement them, um, information about some of the costs or revenues and the equity considerations. So that's what we're trying to do um, in, in this project. So construction excise tax levies a tax on new construction um, uh, to fund housing programs and uh, uh, investments. It allows cities to collect up to 1% of the permit value for new residential development or um, some amount, and the amount is not bounded in the same way for commercial and industrial development. We looked at what if the city had a CET of half a percent to 1%. Um, and what we found is that um, over a five year period, the city might see about $500,000 in revenue from that kind of um, CET. Um, and so as we're considering these other actions, that revenue is very important. Um, next slide, please. Urban renewal. So you've done a lot of work about on urban renewal recently. You can use urban renewal um, to support um, development of affordable housing, either directly support development of affordable housing in ways that we'll talk about in a few moments, um, or um, and or to support development of infrastructure that's necessary to support um, affordable housing development. So for instance, if you... Um, needed a new sewer pipe, um, or if you needed a new intersection um, and all the traffic controls um, within the urban renewal district, urban renewal can be used to fund those. Those can support affordable housing as well as other kinds of housing development. Um, so based on an approximation um, from conversations with city staff, um, about $2.5 million might be available for um, uh, different uses in the urban renewal area. I believe, Steve, that is over a five-year period. That's not all for housing. Um, so that is, a, that is a, a portion of that can be used to support housing. And the city will need to decide how it's allocating those funds um, as it's implementing its urban renewal plan. So if we go on to the next slide. Um, so the equity benefits of CET is that it's a flexible revenue source that can serve low and moderate income households. So that's your households with income below 80% of median family income. And the city can choose how to focus on programs that have specific um, equitable outcomes. Challenges are that the state statutes um, have some limitations on what can be done with CET funds, especially those that come from residential development. Um, commercial and industrial development CET is less limited. Um, and it also adds cost to market rate units um, uh, in favor of uh, supporting lower cost unit development. So those are some of the benefits and challenges. For urban renewal, it can provide a fair bit of funding for your low and moderate income households, and it can do it near some of the employment centers in Tualatin. 
building too much housing in your urban renewal area that risks concentrating um, uh, poverty in your urban renewal area. So you want to be careful to also have market rate housing and to build affordable housing outside of your urban renewal area. So throughout the city. Um, and you don't have a lot of uh, people located in your urban renewal area, but you have the, the potential to displace um, existing residents. So you have to watch out for that. And your urban renewal area is in an, uh, a lot of it's in a floodplain. So you have to watch out for that um, equity challenge. How can you support development in the floodplain without putting people at um, uh, unacceptable risk? On to the next slide. You guys have already done a lot of the work with the um, um, nonprofit tax exemption. So I'm not going to, to spend too much time on this one. Um, the work that the city um, still has on its list for this one is working with your taxing district or overlapping taxing districts to get them on board with granting this um, tax exemption. And that's happened in uh, a numbering of neighboring cities. Um, so we'll go to the next one. The multi-unit property tax exemption. This is a tax exemption for, um, for obviously multi-unit developments, so um, apartments essentially, um, where it can be granted over a 10-year period. The city decides um, where it's granting this exemption, if it's granting it. Um, so a, a certain geography, um, usually centered um, around a downtown, but not always on, only on the downtown. Um, and the city gets to decide what criteria it has for granting the exemption. So there's a lot of local control in, in, in this one. Um, the city needs to, uh, again, get um, your overlapping taxing districts to participate in this, Otherwise, it just doesn't provide enough incentive to get development of housing that's um, affordable at 80% of median family income. <clears throat> um, if you had uh, 100 units of housing that was built over a five year period, um, the foregone revenue that the city would um, have over that five years um, would be a total of $144,000 approximately. Um, and that's not each year, that's that's um, over, you know, cumulatively over the five years. So there is um, some revenue that would be foregone. This is a tax exemption that can't go longer than 10 years, and the city can grant it for less than 10 years. System development charge exemptions. So the thing to remember with this is that your system development charges, you, you know this already, they're there for a reason. They're there to pay for um, your parks and your water. Um, uh, and so that's what we're talking about, cities, um, SDCs. So you don't want to just exempt SDCs for everything. SDCs are there for a purpose. Um, in certain specific instances, like where you're getting income restricted affordable housing development uh, or certain types of uh, market rate housing development that are affordable, you may consider paying SDCs through some other source. That other source could be your construction excise tax. It could also be your urban renewal district. So again, if you got 100 units of uh, multifamily where you exip, exempted SDCs for very good reasons, um, you would have to uh, backfill about $751,000. Um, again, that would be 100 over five years. So that's cumulative for all those 100 units. Thinking about the equity um, challenges and benefits of this. So system development charge exemptions can be really important for supporting your um, income restricted housing. So lower than 60% of median family income can also be important for um, serving uh, your households um, where you wanna get development at uh, about 80% of median family income that's affordable there. Can also be uh, important for that. The challenge is that it, it foregoes revenue, which has to be back through filled through some other source like CET or like urban renewal. Um, your property tax exemptions, again, the they can be used in a similar way as the SDCs. Um, and again, they forego revenue. Um, the city, city could choose to backfill something like MUPTI through its CET. Um, it wouldn't be a good idea to backfill it through urban renewal for a number of reasons. Um, and then over 10 years after MUPTI is expired, 
the rents are more likely to increase to market rate. So they would be lower for, for the 10 years where the, um, uh, uh, where the incentive was applied. So the property tax exemption applied. I only have a few more of these. So we looked at two potential actions to support um, home ownership, down payment assistance and rehabilitation programs. Um, in both these cases, these are relatively expensive on a per household basis. So we looked at what if the city was doing down payment assistance over a five year period for 10 households. Um, down payment assistance, of course it can vary, um, but we saw typically that it was 25,000 to like 110,000 per unit. So that's uh, 250,000 to 1.1 million for 10 units um, over that five year period. For rehabilitation, um, rehabilitation can include things like weatherization, um, big repairs, um, like roof or foundation repairs. It can also be um, something like uh, accessibility improvements, so ramps or widening doorways. Um, again, we've estimated, um, this is a typo, it should be 75,000 uh, to uh, half a million for 10 units, depending on the type of subsidy granted. So that's a pretty wide range. So 75,000, not 750,000. Next slide, thank you. Um, the equity benefits of both of these are really big. So households that have been historically excluded from home ownership can really benefit from down to payment assistance, especially if you pair it with um, other actions that we're not considering here, um, like uh, working with a, um, a land trust, a community land trust, um, that uh, their purpose is to um, support home ownership for low-income households, especially those that have been historically excluded from home ownership. Um, it allows these households to build intergenerational wealth through some amount of ho housing equity. Um, its challenge is that, is that it has a lot higher cost per households, which means that you can serve fewer people in fewer households. Rehabilitation helps your existing households who are low income, because you want to focus on low income housing households, your existing low income households stay in their house um, by helping them with, you know, large repairs or weatherization or accessibility improvements. Um, again, the cost is um, relatively high for, uh, uh, for things like extensive repairs um, and uh, there's limited funding. Um, so in both these cases, um, the question is, is how do you decide who receives assistance? For house, home rehab, there's a little bit more funding that's available from state and federal sources, especially right now. So summary, we, we put it all together here so that we're showing you the, uh, the approximate cost over five years and, and of course over 20 years, um, uh, depending on how many units are, are developed, the 20 years is more of a uh, a, a longer term guesstimate. So our next slide is the questions to be answered. So your funding sources, they just aren't sufficient to do all of these, uh, all of these actions. If you adopt a CET at a 1% rate, it might result in half a million dollars in revenue in the first five years. There's a lot of uh, questions and, you know, housing can have uh, less development some years and more development other years. Um, then there's the question of how it should be used. And these are questions that I think are going to come out of this project and have to be answered as the city is looking at implementing these actions. Um, so are you gonna use it predominantly for backfilling as foregone SDCs, for um, backfilling um, things like MUPTI? Are you gonna use it for um, housing rehabilitation or down payment assistance? The same sort of questions for urban renewal. Um, next slide, please. And so now that we've told you that those, those just aren't great sources of money, here's the, the sources of, of funding um, that the city might consider. The ones in blue are, are, have more potential. So things like grants from the state and federal government the city could choose without um, having to uh, jump through a bunch more hoops to use urb, uh, its uh, general fund funds revenue if it chose to, but of course um, those are, are fully committed right now. 
So sources that are, are less available or not available are things like um, lodging tax uh, increase, um, an increase in marijuana tax, real estate transfer uh, tax and second home taxes. Those are not uh, legal in Oregon at this point. Um, and then there's funding sources that are, are less likely to be supported, um, uh, at least as far as we can tell right now, like a Tualatin specific general bond or local option levy, or my favorite, a sales tax. Um, that'll get you kicked right out of Oregon if you try to impose one of those. So this is also something for the city to consider as it's implementing its HPS, if any of these other sources of funding um, uh, become more available. And, and certainly I think the state and federal uh, grant funds, especially over the next couple of years, may be more affordable, um, available. Next slide, please. So as you're implementing your housing production strategy, um, one of the things that um, we're, we're recommending is that, you know, if the city establishes revenue sources um, for housing like a CET, um, then the city might establish uh, an oversight committee. Um, and that oversight committee, you'd wanna ensure that there's representation from uh, groups that have been historically excluded um, uh, or are um, more likely to be low income. Um, and you might also consider compensating committees for their participation. Um, sometimes um, compensation in, in the um, form of uh, simply childcare, um, direct stipends or payments that can help with things like childcare. Um, some cities um, send their uh, committee members uh, dinner um, for the family. They have it delivered on uh, committee nights. There's a lot of different ways that that, that can work. Um, and uh, then you're going to look at, um, we suggest you look at partnerships with nonprofits who support specific uh, types of groups. So culturally specific outreach, for instance. Um, there's a lot of other opportunities um, for building um, equity in. So next slide, that shows our next steps. Um, and then I wanna answer your questions. I apologize for zooming through that all so fast. <clears throat> Thank you. Questions? Uh, Councilor Reyes and Councilor Person Crack. Yeah, um, when you were talking about uh, rehabilitation or repairs or any uh, assistance to homeowner, like say uh, someone who owns a home, and has like, would that be also an, an example of like a build like a like a little room in the back or like an attachment? Um, I forget the name of them. They have a particular name, but it's it's where you can you can rent it out. Or, would that be? Is that one of those? Is that part of that rehabilitation? A lot of rehabilitation programs that I've seen don't necessarily include um, expansion. They focus on home repairs, but I don't see a reason that your program couldn't include expansion. You just, depending on where you're getting funding for from some of these, like the Oregon Health Authority's Healthy Home Grants, mm -hmm. probably would only consider cover home repairs and not uh, expansion pieces, but you're, you're your program could ex include that if you had funding to support it. How about converting um, like a garage into a home or it, um, is that part of that? I think that it program? could could be part of it if you uh, if you define it that way. You just have to watch out again for what your funding sources allow. Okay. And of course, the different funding sources have different requirements. Thank you. Sure. Oh, well, when I look at the construction excise tax, it looks fairly equitable because it could help bring in people to live here. But then I also see that you're estimating up to 500 grand. And where I have, I'm having a hard time is like the system development charges. It only includes, if I'm reading this correctly, parks and water, which are two areas where we really can't afford to, you know, not have those funds. So I hate to play games with them that part of it, I guess. So <laughs> you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't exempt and then not have paid your system development charges. You would, in places that you have um, funding to support it, 
exempt them and pay them from a different funding source. So for instance, if you had uh, a, an income restricted building being built in your urban renewal district um, and you wanted to um, pay all or part of the system development charges to support that building development, which is a big, big deal, um, you'd pay it from urban renewal, for instance, um, if that was something you identified um, uh, oh, in your urban plan. Well, I so see you that. Could just exempt I'm not, them. I'm not sure that's what we fully want to use our urban renewal from. And I'm just, if I'm looking right. straight at that CET, it doesn't even, it, like it doesn't cover, it would cover what, 70 units maybe? <laughs> so it, yeah. It, and so I, you I, might know I'm doing, I know I'm doing apples and oranges here, but um, it just concerns me taking mm -hmm. that route. And um, you'd and only want to exempt as much as you could cover from a, existing funding sources. Exactly. And um, I, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's really difficult because you're taking money and moving it around basically, but it, it seems like it would be nice to help both people um, that can't afford to buy and to help um, like with the down payment assistant and home rehabilitation. But is that, that seems like something that should be a more of state level thing. Not that we don't want to help those people, especially like um, so they could stay in their homes or be first time home buyers, but how much can the city really do to help with that? Well, the city can apply for grants. Um, if the city has excess funding, um, uh, which I'm not saying that the city has excess funding, um, then the city could put those funds towards that. Um, uh, you can work with an existing organization that does uh, um, rehabilitation or weatherization. So Clackamas County has a, a, a program, um, for instance. Um, I can't remember about Washington County this moment, but there are also nonprofits, so you they, can they contribute. Do the funding through community develop block grants. Okay. Washington County gets so, the and disperses it. So you can contribute from other funding sources. Um, a lot of cities do use CDBG funds, community development block grants, um, to support um, rehabilitation. So that might be one more where the city's action is looking at writing uh, grants. The uh, Healthy Homes program is a new program that's still in development by the state that um, is intended to grant funds to cities to support rehabilitation of housing. And on that, like the home rehabilitation, could we do that? Like, I guess you don't want to exclude, but could you like have a specific program for seniors that just want to stay in their home? We do anything we want, basically. Um, uh, um, I would imagine that, that doing anything we want isn't quite them. right. Um, you can't quite do that, but you can have programs that are are targeted towards seniors. Um, so accessibility improvements are certainly targeted to keeping seniors in their homes. So building ramps, widening doorways, that kind of thing. Oh, nice. A lot of cities look for that. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for your answers. Sure. Another question. Um, I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So we all know what's going on in Salem when in the discussion is about this. Um, I don't know if you're paying attention or if you have any insight. You know, we're hearing rumblings, the mayors, about you know Salem coming up with some kind of bill, especially given the emphasis by the governor, uh, helping cities produce more housing. And obviously, yep. they're taking money and... Uh, what are you hearing about that? And I'm assuming that if the state does stand up some programs, these, that would be a source of grants that don't exist today, but we might be able to dip in in the future. Yes. Um, uh, my crystal ball says very likely. I think my crystal ball might be a magic eight ball. Magic eight ball. Um, um, what I'm I'm hearing is a lot, still a lot of different rumblings. And so they haven't coalesced around um, uh, that I know of this moment and have changed. Um, around really specific um, actions, but I, I have heard about a variety of different funding sources. Um, what I can say is, this is the, my pessimist, I apologize. No what, matter what the state does, it won't be enough, but it'll be more than, than, than we already have. So I think the state has a big role to play in this. Um, I think the city should also look at its opportunities, um, whether that's 
um, uh, you know, granting property tax exemptions in, in selected cases, um, uh, exempting system development charges where you can backfill it from um, something like urban renewal or CET. Um, those, those actions can, can speak really loudly and help attract the nonprofits um, that, that can help do this to work in your community, can help build the housing. It shows local, uh, uh, local skin in the game, um, and it also helps close that funding gap. Yep. I agree. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to see something come forward soon because uh, yeah. it's all a lot of talk, like you're saying now, and you see concrete actions and dollars behind it, grant programs, maybe like you're saying, matching dollar grants. Uh, but like you're saying, it's not going to be enough for the whole state because uh, the, the demand is just so high. But uh, if we can make little baby steps here in Twelfth, it would be terrific. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you for your time tonight. Thank you so much. And I look forward to talking to you again in a month or two. All right. Let's get that. All right. Uh, next up, uh, everyone's favorite topic, especially Councilor Pratt and I, uh, the I-205 Tolling Project Environmental Assessment Overview. Welcome, Cody and Mike. Talked about tolling a lot this morning at the Washington County Coordinating Committee. And you're yeah. always talking about it in class, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to make a joke joke about how this being everyone's favorite comment, but you beat me to it. So, <laughs> and just remember, we are reporting; we are not endorsing. Yeah, indeed. Yes. Um, so this works good. Uh, so we're here to talk about the I two hundred five toll project environmental assessment. Um, this was circulated by ODOT on February 21st. Our goal tonight is to facilitate a discussion around the comment letter that staff will develop to submit on behalf of council during this comment period. Um, the comment period was recently extended from 45 to 60 days. Made many agencies in the region submitted letters requesting the extension due to the, the length and complex nature of the document as well as a lack of translated materials. So that was a major issue up front. We uh, requested a 90 day comment letter, but have not heard whether or not that will actually be granted, fingers crossed, but uh, it's impossible to say at this point. Um, just before we get started, uh, you know, there's experts in front of us here, Mayor Bubenick, Councillor Pratt, Councillor Gonzalez, all participate on regional tables. So at any point, if you feel like jumping in and adding things, please go ahead and do so. Here is the agenda for the evening. Um, I'll provide some high level details. Mike will be our technical expert. We'll begin with a brief overview of the process that led us, led us to this point, as well as the EA document itself talk about some of the details captured in the EA and say a few words on the plan for using tolling, uh, electronic tolling gantries. Uh, there are a few key figures in the document that we'll walk through before highlighting the proposed mitigation measures that are ident identified in the document, specifically for the intersections around the Tualatin area. Uh, we have a summary of where the money from the I-205 tolling project should hypothetically go, and a slide summarizing the many ways that council is currently participating in the ongoing discussion around tolling, and then we will open it up for discussion. So the discussion around tolling has been going on for many years at this point, leading up to the recent National Environmental Policy Act review process, or NEPA, and the environmental assessment is part of that NEPA process. So I will let Mike walk through the basic history of how tolling moved from an idea to a reality. Well, not quite a reality yet. Yeah, not yet. Uh, so back uh, leading up to House Bill 2017 and 2017, uh, representatives from this region were really pushing for two big projects on freeways. One was the Highway 217 widening that's under construction now, and the other was uh, widening I-205, adding a third lane in each direction from Stafford Road to Oregon City, which would include work on the Abernethy Bridge over the Willamette River. Um, 
the I-205 project is a lot more expensive than the Highway 217 widening, uh, like several hundred million dollars more. Uh, so the legislature said, well, we don't have several hundred million dollars. Um, so if you want this project implemented, we'll need to start looking at tolls. And that's been their line and kind of their explanation of it. So they asked ODOT to look into developing a tolling program. Um, they've since asked ODOT to also look into developing tolls on all of I-205, the whole rest of I-205 and all of I-5 from the Boone Bridge and Wilsonville to the Columbia River. Um, this, so that's the story behind it. This particular environmental assessment is just of the I-205 toll project and not the whole rest of the region project. Uh, so then ODOT started moving forward and trying to develop the program and working through what we're seeing so far. So the environmental assessment is a complex 200 page document with at least 25 technical appendices totaling well over a thousand pages. And um, this is one of the reasons why everyone is digging into it right now in such a frenzy trying to suss out what all is in there and how it might impact us. But just some of the things that's captured in the document, the project background, purpose and need, the goals and objectives, and the project alternatives, which at this point are a build alternative and a no build alternative. There was originally a handful of alternatives that didn't make it through to the environmental assessment process. Um, so I think that's a key point. Yeah. It's comparing what's out there today with a three lane I-205 with tolls. It doesn't include a three lane I-205 with no tolls option. So, and that will be the difference in all the different like diversion discussions and things we'll be looking at. Indeed, and uh, if we had gone through and done a deep dive on the assessment, it could easily turn into a four hour workshop, which I'm sure no one is interested in on a Monday evening. So we're gonna try to hit some of the, <laughs> <laughs> some of the high level important things. <laughs> um, one of the major areas of importance uh, are the proposed gantry locations in the build alternative. So there is one mainline gantry structure across all lanes at the Abernathy Bridge, two gantry structures at the Twalton River Bridges, one across the mainline northbound travel lanes and one across the southbound travel lanes. Here is a visualization of those gantry locations on the left. Top corner are the Twalton River bridges, and on the right are the Abernathy Bridge uh, toll gantry area. And then we have a map of the whole uh, proposed area on the bottom there. The proposed toll gantries will be all electronic, as many people know at this point. Uh, they'll function by scanning a transponder on each vehicle that drives under the gantry. Uh, we heard the grapevine that ODOT may be providing those transponders for free. So hopefully that is true, um, but is just word on the street at this point. Uh, this is relatively the same system they use on many of the tolled ro roads and bridges in Washington state. So if there's no transponder in your car, it'll take a picture of your license plate and send you a bill to your address. Anything else on this one? Well, just an anecdote. I was driving in another state recently and went through one of their toll locations and they sent us a bill. And so we sent them a check and then they sent us another bill later saying, we never got your check. So now your bill is $5 higher. And so I can see some frustration for people with things like that happening to them as well. And we've also had um, bridges in Pennsylvania, they do the same kind of system. But when you get the bill for your license plate, you get the bill for creating your account and for the fee. Yeah. So, <laughs> because they're not going to do it for nothing. They're going to, they're going to create some yeah. mechanism to collect your, your funds. I just wonder if it costs $25 to process your $5. <laughs> yeah. All very fair things to wonder about. <laughs> yes. Um, the EA includes a series of toll rate assumptions. It's important to note that these are not the rates under consideration. These were just used for modeling. The Oregon Transportation Commission will ultimately set the rates, but we felt it was helpful to see what was included in the modeling details as a baseline. 
So during off-peak hours, rates would be the lowest, ranging from 55 cents overnight uh, to 65 cents in the midday and evening. Those rates increase at peak hours, varying between 165 and 220 to cross a single bridge during the weekday peak hours. So someone living in Tualatin, commuting to an eight to five job in Oregon City would pay almost $9 on some days or every day if that is your daily commute, you don't have any flexibility. The tolls during the periods just before and after the peak would be $1 to cross a single bridge. So basically a through trip crossing both bridges would be double the assumed rate. Um, so you can imagine, depending on what OTC decides, these could be pretty significant charges each month for someone that uses this route frequently. So in, in light of our previous discussion, um, someone working an eight to five job in Oregon City or Clackamas paying $9 a day, you know, each weekday that ends up about $200 a month. And if we think that back to our affordable housing discussion, you know, along with the housing burden. The thing here, the, your first bullet at the last RTAC meeting, they put out that just their bare bone cost of a trip for ODOT is for the credit card fees, the gantries, blah, 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 was 70 cents. So it doesn't even cover that. So there's no way <laughs> you're looking, don't want to get too far into it, the, the toll rates are not going to be this low because it won't cover the cost. Right. So uh, the purple border on this map indicates the area of potential impact studied in the EA. It covers the area along I-205 from the I-5 interchange near Tualatin to the 82nd Drive interchange near Gladstone and south along Oregon 99E, uh, about 10 miles to Aurora. Within this API, ODOT identified 50 study intersections that may potentially experience difference in AM or PM peak hour traffic volumes under the build alternative. Uh, for us, that is up near the kind of upper left corner there at, at intersections around Nyberg 65th and Borland. The summary of intersection effects looks at two specific years of impact, either 2027 as the near term or 2045 as the long term. And there are currently three intersections really close to Tualatin that do not meet the standards in the build alternative, but do meet standards in the no build alternative. Just to zoom forward really quick so you can kind of see that better. Those are the interchanges at I-5 there um, on Nyberg and then around Borland and 65th. Um, so the in 2027, the I-5 northbound ramps and at Nyberg and the I-5 southbound ramps at Nyberg Street would not meet the standards under the build alternative. In 2045, the signalized intersection at Southwest Borland and 65th would also not meet the standards under the build alternative. And so because those intersections are impacted by the build alternative, ODOT was required to identify mitigations for those intersections in this document. Mike attended many of the mitigation meetings held by ODOT over the summer. So I'll let him walk through some of the mitigations that are proposed uh, in the EA. Um, so they gathered staff from you know, cities, counties that were, uh, had locations affected and then started asking, what can we do? What could we do? Uh, among a group of city representatives, there's some question about how much they really listened to what staff was saying. <laughs> Everyone asked. <laughs> they don't take action. Do they? Yeah. And some differences with the way it was characterized in the EA. Uh, with the EA saying that they really listened and other staff from other agencies and I, I somewhat agree uh, so that they they may have had their ears open but the feedback didn't really affect what actually got into the document uh, so on Borland Road from 65th to Stafford uh, they were in, anticipating and contributing to the uh, regional transportation plan that's RTP that's a metro document planning for the region to a project to add 
uh, pedestrian pathways along 65th Avenue, um, which is a different location than Borland Road. But where on 65th? Because if you go towards the Rosenberg Road, it's dangerous. Yeah, it's a project that we have on 65th, basically from Nyberg Lane, past Borland to the southern city limits, just right by I-205, um, which you know would be helpful to have, but it doesn't really address the issue of pedestrians walking along Borland Road. Or the diversion and the ambulances that can't get to the hospital. Correct. The elementary school that's right there. Yep. All good points, <laughs> yes. Uh, and then on Borland Road between Stafford and the Tualatin River Bridge, this is east of Stafford Road, so past the roundabout. Uh, they'd be contributing to a Clackamas County, what they call RTP strategic, and that's basically unfunded, but still on the list, um, project to add paved shoulders, you know, sort of bike lanes, essentially, um, but not sidewalks there. And then also to contribute to uh, Clackamas County, again, strategic, so not currently funded, uh, project to add uh, paved shoulders. Uh, basically from the bridge over to West Lynn. So they'd be proposing to add paved shoulders along Borland Road from the roundabout to West Lynn city limits. Getting from 12 to the roundabout of which one? Right. Their contention is that the diversion is not as high on the Borland Road area because the tolls start east of Stafford Road. Is their contention. Mm -hmm. And... Couple of the intersections in Tualatin that there would legally be required to mitigate for that meet standards currently would not meet standards with tolls are the I-5 interchanges at Nyberg Road, the two intersections there. The mitigation measure they identify in the EA is yellow reflective sheeting around the back plates of the traffic signals. <laughs> which why they, they need mitigation there, but not on Borland Road. Where's this traffic coming from? Good question. <laughs> yeah. So in the highway safety manual research, it has been established that adding the yellow reflective back plates does reduce crash rates by a couple percent. Um, so that's why we're seeing those more and more at signals around the region. You crash when you're not moving. <laughs> um, but you know, we don't consider that to be substantive. No, substantial <laughs> mitigation. Uh, and then on at 65th and Borland, uh, and this was one that we brought up at a meeting. Uh, it's a project that we submitted for county MSTIP funding, a major street transportation improvement program funding, uh, was to add a northbound right turn lane from 65th Avenue onto Borland. They listed it as widening, restriping, and widening the westbound approach. I think they meant the northbound approach. That's why we have in brackets here to include a northbound right turn lane. Um, and that project would actually increase capacity at that intersection because uh, that's one of the critical traffic movements, particularly in the rush hour, uh, because northbound traffic right turns and straight through ends up in one lane. So if we can separate out the right turns, we can really add a fair amount of capacity there. So in that way, um, that project would you know, help capacity at that particular location. When is this proposed mitigation? What what are the chances of this getting funded? Um, that's they've identified it as a potential mitigation measure. They don't identify a plan for when the mitigation measures would get done. They have to have net income in order to do that. They have to pay for the bridge and the widening of Bill Five first. Right. Because they're going to be part of the ministry. So, yeah. Um, so, obviously, we have concerns about some of the proposals in there. We're hearing concerns from all across the region. We thought we'd share some of those with you. you know, a lot of the impact of counties and cities did not agree with the modeling assumptions in the EA from the get go. Um, like us, proposed mitigation projects are either not sufficient, not feasible, or in some cases may not be enforceable. Just because ODOT says they're going to do them, we don't know for sure if they will. 
there has been no analysis of the cumul cumulative effects of the I-205 toll project and the regional mobility pricing project. That is the other huge tolling project proposed in the near future, but there's no real reference to it in this EA. We can only assume that they're going to sort of pile on top of each other once they're both up and running. Well, they're trying to, sorry to interrupt you. No, it's okay. Part of the thing in our tax is they're trying to move up RMPP and have it start within a year after the tolling of I-205. So they're going to put it in high, high mode I speed mode up having both of these tolling systems up fairly quickly. And like you're saying, Cody, they're not, they haven't wrapped it all into the study yet. That's what we're super nervous about. When I-5 and all of 205 is told, just mass diversion. Um, like Mike was mentioning, ODOT has listened, but may have not taken concerns of local jurisdiction seriously. There are serious unmitigated uh, impacts that remain despite the mitigation measures called out in the EA. We know there'll be significant effect on people who need to use I-205, including many low-income workers and members of equity communities. And then there's the question of why told this project when there were other similar price projects around the region that are not contemplating tolls. The Burnside Bridge is an interesting example of that. Um, there are other agencies currently working on this. Um, nearby agencies, including Clackamas County, have hired legal and traffic engineering consultants to review the EA uh, so they can provide guidance on how to comment effectively. The Clackamas County attorneys have specifically been asked to call out salient points from the EA that they can hit hard in their letters. Um, there's a memora memorandum of understanding in development right now. I think Clackamas County is heading up that effort. And they'll be offering the opportunity for local jurisdictions to sign on and participate in the development of the comment letter early. There will also be an opportunity to sign on letter once later once that letter has been drafted and circulated. Um, there are also, I should mention, legislative efforts underway to either slow down or halt the process altogether, which that's basically outside of the scope of this discussion because that has nothing to do with the I-205 EA, which is what we're here to talk about this evening. One other point that I'd add on the concerns, uh, the EA, there's a lot of existing diversion around congestion on I-205 now that we see on 65th Borland, particularly in other agencies see and other roads. The environmental assessment basically um, treats that as an existing condition that does not need to be mitigated. And so they say that the existing diversion is okay and they're only measuring diversion above that. Are they saying because the third lane will be added, that there's an assumption there'll be less diversion? Or? That's That does affect their numbers quite a bit because they're assuming not much divert extra diversion on 65th and Borland because there's so much existing. The existing diversion is very rush, not 20%. Correct. Correct. Get political here. <laughs> can the diversion just be uh, make it optional? You know, two lanes, toll one non, and people can pay who want to go faster, and that's another way of testing the revenue. That's that something occur? they didn't listen to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But they're really listening because each time we go into these meetings, it's nothing is nothing. We don't we don't know nothing about nothing. So it's 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 being shoved down our throats, and all this is nothing. I mean, it's just amazing. But do you really think something will be made? Uh, it's frustrating. My when I look at like in the I didn't get through the whole thing, but like <laughs> um, in one point five goals and objectives, there's so much of this that. Like you, you talked about the equitable part already, and you know there's not so much our city maybe, but like Oregon City, and once they hit um, uh, Wilsonville and stuff, there's people that have to get on and off the freeway to go to the grocery store or go to um, right. school every day. So they're gonna, yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem very equitable. And then the diversion is a goal, limit additional diversion, and there's it's mentioned like three times in these goals about. Um, Support other modes of transportation, tra transit walk, support multimodal travel, and the and the study itself says 
you know, basically like good luck trying to ride a bike down. <laughs> so so it, it, I think I don't get how this doesn't seem to meet the goals that they outline themselves. That's definitely a concern that we're hearing around the region as well, is that there are goals and priorities laid out that the document seems to indicate will not help achieve. So um, definitely worth noting and potentially commenting on. Yeah. So the EA doesn't really go into financial details, but we thought it could be helpful just to look at where the revenue from the project will ultimately go. So the the plan is for revenue to go toward the construction of the I-205 improvement project, which includes all the seismic improvements on the Abernathy Bridge, the Tualatin River Bridges, and seven other bridges along the I-205 area there. It'll also uh, add a third lane in each direction on I-205 from Stafford, Ro Stafford Road to Oregon 213. Um, there is a traffic and revenue analysis running concurrently with the EA, which forecasts net revenues in the range of 500 to 800 million in construction funding uh, from toll bonds, which basically their plan is to leverage the income coming in from the tolls to then bond for the construction projects. But we know a large portion of those revenues would go towards either running the project or building the infrastructure. So the net revenue for construction is really just an estimate at this point. I think that bottom bullet there is important. <laughs> the net is. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. much. Yeah. So it's, it's millions of dollars in terms of infrastructure for the area. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Somewhere in the range of forty million to build the gantries and the infrastructure. Once the program is going, about a third of the revenue would go just to manage the program, or as some have said, just so we have the privilege of being able to pay tolls. This I've seen that price go up to hundred million for the infrastructure too. Yeah, yeah. the latest submission was hundred million for the infrastructure for the gantry. This slide's just to provide an overview of how the city's plugged into the regional tolling policy discussions through WCC, C, RTAC, C4, the C4 Metro Subcommittee and Tolling Subcommittee and the R1 Act. So we have experts here who are doing the good work. Um, and at this point, we'd like to open it up with these discussion questions or additional questions for us. Should we send a comment letter during the public process here or not? And if we do, what are some of the things that we should emphasize? What would we want to say in that letter? We've heard some good things already. Yes. The only thing is, is that they've heard, I, I mean, we need to do it, but it's yeah. just so frustrating because we don't expect any action from it. I I also think that we should highlight the services that are in that area, like like the Orland Free Clinic, um, you know, Costco. I mean, these are areas that these are stores, uh, either a free clinic, but the uh, Costco are stores that people that are um, looking to buy bulk, bulk items and typically big families with, you know, under maybe poverty level. I think that will be working class people that are trying to. Yeah, I think we should highlight that because I don't know if they're even considering all that in um, the labor, you know, people that provide services such as um, housekeeping and in that, specifically in that area, there's a lot of um, housekeeping, people that provide housekeeping services, landscaping. I mean, those, I don't know, they're considering that when they're thinking about how much to charge or all that stuff. Well, they're gonna have programs for people, but I don't know. That's why the administration costs would probably be high because they're making all these exceptions, but then people have to learn how to apply too. Right, yeah, that yeah. Difficult. That's another, yeah. Because even if they are out there, if they don't know how to. Right, from what I've seen from what they've done in this EA on their website, they don't make things easy to find. 
when, <laughs> when they presented the, the Washington example plan of the very, this tolling that was occurring, they, they also demonstrated that uh, Washington had a lot of uh, different roads to, to go to, six different roads off this highway to, to avoid the tolling. We have one in this Portland. I mean, Westland is gonna get hammered right through Old Town Westland, through Stafford Circle. And then you have the five churches that are right there on that mm -hmm. circle as well. Um, so we have one road that's going to mitigate that people, they said in that presentation to give it about two years to soften up people, soften up the people, soften them up mm -hmm. to make sure that they understand that. It, and so was there traffic studies done? I had read that that road was not part of the traffic study because it did not pertain to them, Borland. Did they do traffic studies on on that road? They did include Borland and Stafford in the traffic analysis of it. But the monitoring, it they they implied, or what I heard was that they're going to monitor ODOT roads, and it's on us to monitor our local roads with uh, monitoring equipment we already have there. So there's nothing on Borland. Road. No, and then that's in, in before you get to, to our two Alton boundary, but at the very furthest part, there there is a private school right there. I think like a, a farm school next to a Montessori school. When somebody goes to turn left on that, the pen, it jams back all the way to almost Bridgeport Elementary School just for a couple of laps because traffic's coming in so strong. Um, north, you know, and that's a big that's a big safety issue. Yeah, safety is a huge one, and then in our hospital right here on Sixty Fourth and Borland, it's a huge one too. And if you if an ambulance is slow, that could mean somebody's life. So if it's going to come down, what is the mitigation plan for that Borland Road? Is it to expand it? That's, I mean, I think it's sidewalks, lights, but it's still two lanes, and there's still no middle lane to stack traffic to make left or right turns either way. And I would add a couple of things. Uh, you didn't highlight it in here, but the lack of alternatives. You know, mm -hmm. East-West Transit really doesn't exist. Uh, we're, we're talking a lot about it, but again, the net revenue is supposed to pay some money to TriMet, but will there be any net revenue? Yeah. TriMet's like, okay, you know, the money they can send is can only be used for capital costs, mm -hmm. not for drivers. So they're gonna have a bunch. They can buy a bunch of buy a bunch of buses. They're gonna sit in the lot because they don't have no one to drive them. So that's not gonna help us at all. There's been quite a bit about you know greenhouse greenhouse gases that totally is gonna decrease greenhouse gas emissions because cars can run efficiently and you know, the representatives of Clackamas County are beating their heads on the table going, well, what about all the cars that are sitting on in the diversion routes? Those greenhouse gas those emissions sure. are going up in the air anyway. So yeah, 205 will be nice crystal clean air, but to the north and south with it, the emissions are spewing out of the cars that are trying to avoid the tolls. Um, and I think the big one is the RMPP. No one has any idea when all of a sudden there's a toll on the Boone Bridge and 99E becomes a parking lot and how it just circulates through the whole region, how 99E is going to be, especially that's a beautiful way to save money if you come from the South, because you're not having to pay for a 205 toll or an I-5 toll. And the 99W is a parking lot now, guess what's going to happen then? Because the people coming out of Yamhill County, Marion County, you're going to stay on 99W. And you... Barbara Boulevard, I mean, it's, it's just it, them trying to keep the two separated doesn't make things make sense. If you go to their tolling page, there's like a little couple page little, I don't know if you've read it. I call it a marketing piece, but mm -hmm. they they put a spin on things like they're saying, well, the mm -hmm. diversion will mean more people going through your town and, you know, that'll mean more better for the economy. And I, I just think of like West Lynn with the Lamont Falls Drive being a just total standstill. I don't imagine that's going to help boost the economy. And then uh, we didn't focus here on here either. The toll rates you're seeing are for passenger vehicles, right. trucks, and also all mm -hmm. our business community is going to pay higher rates, much yeah, higher rates for the thousand. tolls. So you think Mill Guard Windows, UPS, Amazon, you know, some of our biggest employers here in town are really kind of nervous of what this going to impact is going to be on their business because they're going to have to pass it on. And then they're also nervous about are their prison employees going to say, screw this. I'm not going to work in Mill Guard Windows anymore because I don't want to pay the tolls. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that got wrapped in the, 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 the economic impact I know is in the EA and it's big. Mm -hmm. And people, 
um, for getting into small businesses, came up with like, okay, say you're a small business in uh, West Lynn or in Milwaukee, are you gonna actually pay to go with the, your favorite mechanic anymore? Mm -hmm. Or are you just gonna find one that's not on the toll route? So there's an impact to the local community. So when you know, I-5 is, if I-5 is pulled, what's the impact gonna be on all small businesses there in 12? Well, people are gonna like, I'm not going there anymore. Mm -hmm. I'll go to some, I'll go over, I'll take an extra few minutes and stay in the parking lot that is 26. Well, it's still free, because that came up this morning, that is a potential toll target um, to avoid toll. So there's the economic impact. Have you seen anything where they've defined what a large, the trucks that get the four times rate as opposed to two times? Have they defined that anywhere that you've seen? There haven't been any details on what the toll rates will be. That's the secret. Yeah. That's the secret they don't want to let out. <laughs> I think there's still a lot of wrangling. Yeah. I think mean, one of the other things that I wanted to bring up, uh, you know, we talked about the traffic analysis and the diversion. They've scientifically calculated numbers going through different places and different intersections, but it all hinges on one big guess. And the modeling isn't really capable of kind of duplicating the human reasoning of do I pay the toll and stay on the route or do I go to an alternate route? So what they've done is they've estimated a certain number of minutes of delay that would result from tolls. That would be the equivalent of paying the toll and cause the same amount of diversion. Uh, I don't know how many minutes it is, and I don't know how they correlate that with dollars, um, but that in itself is a, a big estimate or guess upon which all of the modeling data hinges. So you're saying they decided that if people determined they'd have to wait more than like 10 or 15 minutes, they will just pay the toll? Is that what their model is doing? Uh, um, so the model can't really duplicate human reasoning of the, okay, there's a toll here, I'll go around. Now, some people, they're in a hurry, they're paying the toll anyway. Some people, like my uncle, drive to New York City, he'd always go 15 minutes out of his way to take the Third Avenue Bridge instead of the Triborough Bridge just to save, you know, a $2 toll. And there will be some of both. And so they tried to approximate how many people would divert to a different route. Um, by using parameters that the model could actually work with, and which is delay. So what they did is to model, say a $3 toll, um, or in this case, a $2 20 toll per bridge. They just put a three minute delay on that link on I-205. And they'd assume that it would take three minutes longer to go across that part of I-205 than it actually would. And they're figuring that effect on the diversion is the amount that would detour due to the toll. That's interesting because the conversations I've had, they show what their model says and then every city is saying, oh, we think it's gonna be a lot higher in the diversion levels just from what we, I mean, it's all a guess, but we're guessing what human nature is, I guess, more than they're trying to yeah. use a model they constructed. Yeah, and there's a concern that I brought up early in the process. Um, they said kind of, we hear you, but we don't really have a good way to actually model the who's gonna switch routes because of the toll. But that would be what the whole point of monitoring, I mean, if they put it in, like if they monitored, they could see the effects of this and they're really minimizing what they're gonna monitor. So when are they gonna know? Other yeah. than looking at Berlin Road at a standstill. So. Wasn't there a discussion about the modeling, like, like you're saying, what year they pick? because there was mm -hmm. discussion about um, the peak of congestion on 205 was you know, pre-COVID, and they picked a year, uh, several years before that, where diversion wasn't as bad. And so at the RTAC, there was discussion, why don't you use where it was maximum diversion off 205? No doubt was like, no, we're using the model from, I think, four years prior. Yeah, like 2015 or something. Yeah, like, yeah. yeah. And, was, and we were like, what? <laughs> Why wouldn't you use where we knew how bad it was? And I think it's part of it, like you're saying is, okay, then they can say, well, the diversion was bad already. So it's only a little bit worse now. <laughs> um, and it, it, that was driving us crazy. And going with the model thing you mentioned, Mitch just mentioned, they came up with the RTAC that Washington State just did that big tunnel project. I think it's around Seattle. 
yeah. where they had anticipated modeling how much revenue they would make, and the revenues aren't coming because people aren't taking the tunnel. So now the, the Washington legislature is having to backfill the costs and pay the bonds out of general fund because all the people they thought would be taking this tunnel never materialized. Mm -hmm. yep. So you might be forcing diversion and they're going to make this project and you might be ripping down 205 because there's nobody on it, but the state legislature is going to have to backfill it if, if their modeling is wrong. Is that what happens if these tolling revenues don't cover the cost yeah. of the project? Yep. They'd have to you know, pay for it. For pay the bonds. One of the means. I think on the the topic that came up a little earlier about they used the 2015 metro model instead of a more recent one. And yes, there was a lot more, I think a lot more traffic in 205 in 2019 than yeah. 2015 because this whole area of the metro region has grown so much. Um, they didn't have a solid enough model from 2019 to be able to use it. The 2015 data uh, had a lot of kind of ground truthing. And they typically do that only every five years. Uh, so their 2020 model, they figure was so affected by COVID that they wouldn't use it. So they end up going back to the 2015. I really appreciate that you explained that to us and it's been asked how many times to ODOT and we've never gotten an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I have a list of questions. Oh yeah, go for it. We've been having a discussion right now. Um, <laughs> So, or maybe some are comments, but I mean, for me, looking at these pedestrian and bike improvements, like, which is great for like going around town and local, but like when I hop on a freeway, I'm not going someplace close where I could walk or ride a bike. I'm going someplace farther away. So when I see that we have pedestrian and bike improvements, again, great for local transportation, but going any amount of distance where I'm going to hop on the freeway anyway, just... I, I don't get it. Um, and maybe there's something I'm missing that somebody else can explain to me. <laughs> no. <laughs> this can be faster. <laughs> well, it might be faster, but um, I mean, and just time. I mean, people are busy. I mean, I would love to ride my bike to Oregon City, but I don't know when I have the time to, you know, to take that much time for transportation. But um, so the one comment I had. Um, so I was on the um, diversion subcommittee, and there's some questions that were brought up that were never answered. I'm sure you're surprised, but uh, we had talked about who's paying for mitigation projects, and when last time that was brought up, when I was on the committee, there was there wasn't a real answer to that. I'm wondering if there's an answer today. Is ODOT paying for it, or is it going to be on the cities, or is it a mixture of both? Do we know anything? <laughs> I have not seen an answer on that okay. or a proposal from ODOT. Okay, because although what I have seen is it'll take so long to pay off the project mm -hmm. that. I would doubt that any tolling revenue would come to the mitigation projects, but I haven't seen that definitively. So basically they're just saying these are things that you could do as a city to improve diversion, not that they would help fund any of it. It's a, it, it's a small thing that you're short on just doing. Right. The improvements are the priority. Right. Um, and then another question I had, um, again, I asked this when I was on the subcommittee and never, I never got an answer, but uh, we were talking about the, the, this mitigation list, and my question was what projects didn't make the mitigation list or, you know, like just didn't make it and why? Because part of the question that ODOT had was, you know, there are just lived experiences that we have in the cities that they're not aware of, um, that their modeling can't capture, perhaps, and um but we never saw the like that list of projects that like just didn't make it. But perhaps there are things that need to be considered. Um, but again, if there's this mitigation list that nobody's paying for, it's like, I don't know. It just seems kind of weird. Um, is there a sunset date yet? Or is there no sunset date on the tolling still? Depends. Depends. You talk to. Okay. Um... There's talk if they just build the bridge, it would be a sunset. Mm -hmm. But if they did 205 and the bridge, it wouldn't be a sunset. And if they do RMPP, it would never mm -hmm. sunset. And that's, I mean, that's one of the, the biggest concerns that I hear from talking to people about tolling is when is it going to end? And, or is this just an open revenue stream forever? As a former New Yorker, it never ends. Once it starts, it never ends. 
Um, and then I have the same thing. I mean, I'm concerned of how it's going to impact businesses. Um, I mean, I think of, you know, places that I travel to go to certain, to you know, patronize certain businesses. And I worry about how our businesses are going to survive. And I mean, is there any sort of, you know, study we can do to say this is, you know, this is the impact to our business community? Because I think it's very important, uh, very important concern for our business community. I mean, I people I know a lot of people that come here for Cabela's and are people going to then shop at you know their local local stores instead of coming and making that trip and and lots of other different stores but the big one that comes to mind. Is there a way in your letter you can just I mean the bottom line is we just want answers. I mean right. they have concerns but it'd be nice to get clear answers on anything. <laughs> I've heard from I don't know specifically but I've heard there's just blatant mistakes in their analysis too that some people are picking up on. I don't know if you picked up on it yet, but eighty-one miles to. Oh yeah, just assumptions they've made that are wrong, um, and that I know. I heard you know their that promotion video for this. There was this, a mistake at like a minute fifty something seconds that went to KTW. So they they are making mistakes. So hopefully. I know it's a tome, Cody, and <laughs> Mike, but if you find anything there, you go, this isn't right. This is, you know, find it, send it off to the Clackamas County or the attorneys and flag it in our letter. It just seems like there's a lot of, um, I don't want to call it distrust, but we don't have answers. There's, there's mistakes. There's, I mean, there's issues that aren't being addressed. And so it's like, there's uneasy, un, like distrust because there's no, concrete answers. Scary. So you mentioned the one question about projects that didn't make the list. Uh, one example is uh, when the diversion group was looking at the Nyberg interchange. Mm -hmm. And basically what they said is Nyberg interchange is already so built out, like double left turn lanes and uh, that they didn't think adding more lanes or more capacity there would be feasible. And they said, well, it's not feasible. So they just kind of moved on. But it should still be looked at and considered to see, I mean, it just yeah. seems like, okay, it's a, just because we know it's a problem doesn't mean it's going to go away by ignoring it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. I mean, especially if we're going to be expected to to handle these problems, I mean, we should have access and visibility to them. If they've done the study, then it just shouldn't fall off a list somewhere. Is that enough for their letter? Or do we want they're going to get so many letters. I mean, they're going to get inundated. I mean, that's yeah. not the last public comment they asked the for. Answer. It was thousands of comments they had to purge through. Not for, well, pretty much that's what they did. Read through. <laughs> so, can, may I ask, um, and maybe this is something that I, you'll mention it, but I have not quite picked up. Uh, is it, I feel like it's just moving forward without any, any, um, consideration of stopping it, yeah. and so I guess it's they're, they're on a timeline because the uh, they have to have the bond money. They kind of front loaded the money to pay for the Abernathy, but they will need the toll funding to complete the payments on the Abernathy Bridge. Mm -hmm. So I've been told from people at ODOT for some reason um, say that the Senate bill. That's floating around that says stop tolling happens, they will stop construction they will. Okay. on the bridge mm -hmm. because they have no money for it. All the assumption is that tolling will go through the Abernathy Bridge at, at a minimum, the Abernathy Bridge. Goes through. If that goes through, then yeah. the tolling will go through. Yeah. The so tolling. There, there are some they're assuming that money is coming in for all of it. So if it doesn't happen, if tolling doesn't happen, none of this will happen. I don't know how you stop a bridge <laughs> improvement project. <laughs> Mid course, but that's what they said they would do. So, if they're two thirds done in the tolling revenue, does it meet expectations? Or are they going to do the same thing? I mean, the legislature has to back the bill. 
that, that that's the, the question we're having is what if um, this doesn't happen? Where, what's plan B for ODOT mm -hmm. for funding these projects? And, you know, before the meeting started, we were talking about the vehicle mile tax. Uh, some folks feel that's inequitable because some we can go out to Eastern Oregon. People have to drive greater distances to get the services than we do here. Right. So, so yeah. we'll pay a higher proportion mm -hmm. of the tax. So what is ODOT going to come up with if this doesn't come because it doesn't go through? Now, are there better alternatives? I mean, is there something else there? I, I finished my article for Walt and Life, and it talks about this. And part of this is folks need to talk to their legislators and senators. Mm -hmm. To see where they stand on this, because this, in addition to housing, homelessness, and a couple other things, this should be top priority in the interstate bridge. This should be a priority, a priority for legislatures because end of twenty, the tolls are supposed to come up at the end of twenty four mm -hmm. in Abernathy. Hmm. So it's not that far away. Can you remind us of the timing for our comment letter? Yeah, currently the due date is April 21st. So what we'll do is <laughs> we'll <laughs> synthesize what we took away from this evening. We'll try to maybe get some clarity on things that are questions to recirculate. So uh, you can continue forming questions or uh, asking for clarification and we'll get a draft for everyone to review and we'll move on from there with the assumption that the due date is going to stay April 21st. And the nice thing here, like Cody mentioned, is the, the Clackamas County cities are working together. Um, so we're all, staffs are talking together, the legal department, um, so that we all, you know, don't have the same exact letter, but we all hit the top of the things we have to mm -hmm. hit specific to our area, part of, you know, as part of the plan, um, you know, that you know, we could look at other city's letters and you know riff on them support them so and then, it's not just ours um the 205 committee is going to start working on issues for c4 letters okay. that will be good. and then uh yeah we mentioned the clackers county attorney would be coming up with points that if they find certain things that would you know give us better legal standing uh our intention would be to include that in the letter as well as long as they agree with the kinds of things that we've heard just wait for the 20th to send it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any other questions? All right, well, thanks, Mike and Cody. Yeah, thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you. Did you read all the appendixes too? Yeah. No way. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> They're on my uh, reading. <laughs> Agenda for tonight. Uh, all right. So for tonight, we've got um, three proclamations. Um, we've got a proclamation for uh, Parkinson's Awareness Month. Who'd like to do that one? Okay. Council Pratt will do that one. Uh, Arbor Month. Councilor oh, Sacco. Everybody write this down because I always forget this. <laughs> Parkinson's. We've got Eagle Scout recognition. I don't think there's proclamation for that. We do have a proclamation for the employee of the year, and I'll read that one. Uh, Councillor Gonzalez, you're up for the Pledge of Allegiance tonight. Um, any uh, discuss any questions about the consent agenda? There is. I do. There is a, a, a agenda that I'd like to get removed from the consent agenda. Okay. And that is the idea advisory committee. I'd like to get that removed from the consent agenda. All right. So when we go to when we start discussing it, go ahead and make a formal request then. Okay. Yeah, it, yeah, it's under ordinance. Yep. I'm number one. So we'll, we'll have a we have more time discussion. Yeah, so it's not the there's only three items of consent. Mm -hmm. We're okay with consent. Yeah. All right. Uh, and then uh, pledge proclamation. 
that will go ahead and do you want to do Don first? Don has an announcement. And imagine that has to do with money. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, I just want to give you a brief update on the parks bond and the bond sale. Uh, particularly, you'll be getting a communication either, I'm not sure if it's directly from me or from our financial advisor by the end of the week. Uh, so right now we're putting together, we've got a team, an internal team, which is Sherilyn, Megan, uh, Ross, myself, and then my assistant director, Matt. We're working with our bond council as well as our financial advisors. We're putting together what's called a, a preliminary official statement. And that's a document that goes out to investors to give them material uh, information about the city, what the bonds are going to be used for, uh, it, just general information about the city, uh, our financial position, and so forth. It's a significant size document. You'll be getting a copy of it by the end of the week so to look at it to see if you notice anything that uh, you want to comment on or any statements you feel might be material materially misstated. Uh, because and you'll we'll ask for comments back by the 28th of March. We'll send it out to the uh, or the financial advisor will send that to the investors on March 29th. The plan right now is for the bond sale to happen on April 12th. And we will then uh, come back to you with the results. Uh, well, hopefully a really good result. And that's what we're anticipating. Uh, we also this Thursday have a call with Moody's for a rating call. Uh, so as you know, we have a double A1 rating, which is the second highest. Uh, they'll either confirm that or if we're hopeful, uh, maybe get upgraded, but uh, you know, we'll present to them, uh, if nothing else, to confirm our AA1 rating. Um, so I just want to give you that quick update that you'll be getting a communication uh, by the end of the week, probably Wednesday or Thursday, to uh, to look over. You don't have to read the whole thing if you don't want to, but this will be your opportunity yeah, to see what we're sending out to the investors and comment if you have any comments. So I just want to give you the heads up before all of a sudden it showed up in your email. Um, I just have one on February 28th. I went to the Willamette River Water Coalition meeting. Um, we approved the budget for the next fiscal year. Um, we also got an update on the Willamette River Basin Feasibility Study. Um, so if anybody's interested in that, I can pull that off their website and send it to you. That's right. Um, I attended a meeting um, at the library with um, with the residents of Las Casitas, yes, people from Las Casitas, and we discussed the um, the park, um, like Stone Ridge Park, uh, and kind of reported back to them about the bond and you know what you know they the plans that they they the different. Um, sketches that we had and which one we went with. So it was a just a good meeting to to report back to them. They had a lot of questions and you know and um but it was that was that's all I did. So. Well done. I have no updates. I, well, I attended the meeting this morning with with you. So that was quite long so right. I'm President Pratt. Um my only meeting was a C4 meeting and we were the first group to get the ODOT presentation on the environmental analysis. And nobody really had much time to read it. And, but the the thing that struck us, which was mentioned, was that like they're they're saying tolling with the third lane as opposed to no tolling without the third lane. So we all thought it was kind of an interesting mm -hmm. look at it. <laughs> That's it. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, it was it was surprisingly light two weeks for you also. Um, on Friday, I attended the Tualatin Chambers uh, Excellence in Business Awards uh, dinner with Sherilyn was there too. And Sherilyn presented uh, some awards. Um, it was a pretty nice uh, time. Uh, first time we've had it in several years since COVID. Uh, very well attended and they threw in uh, DJing and dancing this year. Uh, so very nice time. Uh, I stayed a little while, but I didn't dance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the next thing up, uh, my meetings today, um, start off the morning with the Washington County Coordinating Committee. Uh, ODOT presented their um, statewide transportation improvement plan update for 19, uh, 19, yeah. 2024 to 2027. They had $3 billion statewide to spend on projects throughout the state. 
in our area of region one, which is the metro region, uh, $630 million worth of projects will be funded. They're taking these projects out for public comment. So if you'd like to comment on the one that's closest to us is on April 18th at the Beaverton Library between 11 and 1 p.m. Uh, they're proposing to spend 311 of that 630 million on bridge projects and ADA compliance. Mm -hmm. um, so be, uh, if you have time to go to check it out or go to the website, but they're looking for public comment on their statewide transportation improvement plan. And uh, a project, a study I never heard of, it was the first time uh, this morning was like, what? Uh, it's called the Westside Multimodal uh, Improvement Study. And it's being run by ODOT and Metro. And what it is is studying uh, 26 from Hillsboro all the way to the Vista Ridge Tunnel on how to improve traffic flow, freight flow. And in, in addition to looking at the actual route itself, so there's a buffer area around it. So they're looking at potential diversion of you know when they look at projects or how streets will feed into 26. So basically from Beaverton up to Bethany, uh, they're looking at you know how these how do the streets work together on 26 and what's the possibilities and what are the ideas of how we can get things moving you know quicker and more efficiently on 26 from Hillsborough into the city. Um, one of the biggest things that came up was Cornelius Pass Road. You know, as mm -hmm. an alternate, because I, I never realized this before, you know, trucks with hazardous, hazardous materials aren't allowed through the Vista Ridge Tunnel. Mm -hmm. So what they have to do is uh, deviate up to Cornelius Pass Road and take Highway 30 in into mm -hmm. the city. Um, so, of course, Cornelius Pass Road is a major uh, route now that the state built out and the county built out just most recently. But it's pretty interesting. They're going to have by the end of this year recommendations, everything from widening 26, which I was like, is that possible? <laughs> I thought it was totally built out to tolling 26. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. They're gonna come back with another presentation in a few months, but um, this is something that was never on my radar, uh, I guess, because it's on the west side versus our side. Uh, all the cities on the west side are involved with this project, in addition to the city of Portland, but, um, you know, as as of today, I think the Mayor Cornelius was saying uh, on Sundays on 26th, it's back to pre-COVID levels. Uh, there's backups from Vista Ridge Tunnel all the way up the hill mm -hmm. um, on a Sunday afternoon now. So it's mm -hmm. packed up and uh, the truckers are not using 26 because it's just not um, reliable. They're finding other routes, all weird routes to get, you know, their transient um, freight from Hillsborough into the city of Portland up to the terminals mm -hmm. on the river. Um, that's it. Sherlyn. Um. April 5th from 10 to noon, ODOT is doing a tabling event at the at the Tualatin Public Library for the tolling um, environmental assessment. Uh, so it, there's only one, two, three, four, five of them. One's in Oregon City, or two are in Oregon City, one's in Gladstone, and one's in Tualatin. So kind of cool. We have that up on the city website. And I believe it's on our social media. I saw it uh, through the library. To start pushing that out because mm -hmm. okay. interest is starting to with the EA coming out. Yeah. More and more people are interested in that. Okay. And hearing about it. It'll be way easier to hear from ODOT. And yeah, if we don't know who's turf, we can beat them up. Oh, yeah. Okay. With April 5th, when? April 5th, 10 to noon at the library. Okay. I'll do that. Yeah. Because Councilor Pratt just, Councilor Sergeant Pratt just reminded me, as in my article in the Michael. I'll set a revision in it to include that. It says an information table, so I'm not sure there's a presentation, but I, right. they'll have, I think they'll have staff there. Oh, I think then they'll get prepped with your question. Okay. okay. We can put that on our social media sites like out. Yeah, we can push that out. That was it. Okay. Anything else? We've got 15 minutes or so. Go ahead and uh, close this work session. So we'll come back at seven o'clock. Yeah, you could go eat.